It's My Nerd World, a Star Wars podcast. I'm your host, John Justice. And before we get into the show this week, I want to talk to you about a podcast that I've discovered that I really think you're going to, you're going to enjoy. It's called Bourbon Pursuit. Now, if you're asking yourself, well, I'm not a bourbon drinker, you know, I'm, it's not really my thing. What makes this podcast great is what makes most podcasts great. And that is not only really good hosts who are knowledgeable about the topic that they are discussing, but are actually really into and love the topic that they are discussing. And that's what I found in Bourbon Pursuit. Um, their hosts, Kenny Coleman, uh, Ryan Cecil, Fred Minnick, uh, they talk about their own bourbon adventures. And you can tell, man, these guys get together and they love talking with each other. They all get along great and they love talking about bourbon and they know the ins and outs of the bourbon industry. It's history, the stories behind different labels. So if you find yourself you know, at, at the store looking at bourbon and looking at all the bourbon on the store shelves and you have no idea where to start, well, you need to start with the Bourbon Pursuit podcast, right? Uh, did you know that bourbon is distinctive? Uh, is a, a distinctive product in the United States, right? It can't be produced anywhere else in the world. And no, not all bourbon has to be made in Kentucky. I learned this and a whole lot more listening to Bourbon Pursuit. Now, if you think you like bourbon, get ready to love bourbon. Bourbon Pursuit is the official podcast of bourbon, and it's your best source for all news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And the cool thing is they have three episodes every week. Some are shorter. They do little reviews on products. Some are, are longer and more extensive where you can learn about the next bourbon trends, the personalities behind your favorite brands. You get great bottles and all the juicy scoops on all things whiskey. They've got guests like celebrities and retailers and industry influencers and CEOs and master distillers, brand ambassadors from every major distillery, authors, bloggers, um, and those who hunt for incredibly rare bourbons as well. You can take your knowledge from being a bourbon novice to a bourbon baron or just discover a new topic like I did. Like, wherever the good stuff is poured, Bourbon Pursuit is just a play button away. So go, subscribe now, and follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you go and get your podcast. Trust me, it's an incredibly enjoyable podcast. You are not going to be disappointed. All right, on the show this week... Got an extensive interview, which will be the bulk of the conversation for this week's Star Wars podcast. An extensive interview on uh, with uh, Robert Rodriguez, who is uh, helming the book of Boba Fett from The Hollywood Reporter. So we're going to break it all down and give you my thoughts on the comments made. A lot of really good, interesting insight into the book of Boba Fett, which launches here in just a couple of weeks. And then we also have your listener feedback. So sit back, relax. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. And welcome to a Star Wars podcast here on My Nerd World. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd world. Just let it in. It is my nerd world, the Star Wars podcast, and I am your host, John Justice. Glad you're with the show again uh, this week. Uh, I don't know what you've been doing in terms of your Star Wars fandom and watching, but I know that I have been re-watching uh, The Mandalorian in anticipation of the book of Boba, uh, Boba Fett coming up here in uh, in just a, just a few weeks. I'm about ready to wrap up uh, Season 1, that final episode that Taika Waititi uh, directed. Uh, still one of my all-time favorite episodes of the series in, uh, in Season 1. And as soon as I actually wrap up the show this week, I'm going to sit back down and actually go and finish off that episode and then get headlong into Season 2. Um, and looking forward to spending some time over my vacation uh, working my way through Season 2 as we head into the Book of Boba Fett uh, launching on December 29th. And speaking of which, there's an extensive article from The Hollywood Reporter. It's got a lot of really good, interesting insight 
into the Book of Boba Fett that I'll be sharing with you on the show this week. As always, you can email talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube. We also have a little bit of listener feedback that we'll get to later on in the show. So the uh, article from The Hollywood Reporter, uh, How the Book of Boba Fett Will Shake Up Star Wars, director and showrunner Robert Rodriguez takes us inside uh, Disney Plus's ultra-secretive uh, new Mandalorian spinoff. Um, and one of the quotes from out of the gate in the article was, we couldn't believe what we got to do. So when the second season finale of The Mandalorian aired on December 18th in 2020, a mid credit scene revealed a spinoff series titled The Book of Boba Fett. Now, that is, uh, that's, uh, that this happened just a week after Disney had revealed 10 new Star Wars shows in development during its Investor Day live stream made the announcement even more baffling. And it's funny, it's been a year since we got that major announcement of all of those shows, as they just mentioned. And uh, kind of a bummer we haven't gotten more this year, right? But we know what's coming up next year. And it's probably best for Disney to keep any future shows that haven't been announced um, probably quiet until they know for certain that they're actually going to go and take place. But getting back to the article, um, didn't the company just present its Star Wars slate? And they didn't mention the Book of Boba Fett. Is the Mandalorian canceled? Confused reporters flooded the email inboxes of equally confused publici uh, publicists and showrunner John Favreau, who was quickly booked on Good Morning America to go and clear things up. And he said, even Disney didn't know we were going to drop it like that. Marvel's The Book of Boba Fett co-showrunner uh, co Robert Rodriguez. I got to see the inner workings in Favreau, the writer, producer, director, Dave Filoni, kept this a secret from everybody. Well, not quite everybody. The studio's top executives in business affairs were in the loop, but still, that Disney Plus would make a show that even shocked many at Disney Plus indicates the level of secrecy at the heart of Favreau and Filoni's closely guarded corner of the Star Wars galaxy. Not to mention their rather surprising amount of freedom, given the number of Star Wars theatrical projects developed under talents ranging from Game of Thrones showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Wise to Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins that have buckled under the weight of the reported creative, uh, creative differences. It's a privilege the duo undoubtedly has uh, earned, given The Mandalorian is credited for both reinvigorating the Star Wars brand and successfully launching Disney Plus in 2019. The series became the first non-Netflix show to top Nielsen's weekly streaming chart during its second season, helping propel the nascent streamer to more than 100 million subscribers globally in less than two years. Now, Disney undoubtedly hopes the show will provide another buzzy jolt to Disney Plus sub subscriber growth, which has struggled, right, which has which has turned sluggish, excuse me, in recent months, as has been the case for many other streaming services. For the 53-year-old Rodriguez, a longtime Star Wars fan, the experience was like being inducted into the Jedi Order. I can't even say this is a dream come true because I wouldn't have even thought to dream this, Rodriguez said during a sit-down with his Troublemaker Studios in Austin. The Alita Battle Angel and Sin City director is arguably the perfect fit for Favreau and Filoni's Star Wars hub, even though he, uh, even though the devoutly independent filmmaker says he normally doesn't like to get involved in with franchises unless they are his creation, such as his uh, uh, four Spy Kids films. I usually avoid premier properties. You're never able to please everybody. It's a losing game, Rodriguez says. I'd rather go do something I've created so nobody can say, hey, that's wrong because blank. I created it so it can be anything I want it to be. I love that freedom. That changed with Boba because he was a character that was always underserved. It was a character way more popular than he should have been based on his limited screen time. So it's almost like starting with an original character. You can kind of do whatever you want so long as you make him cool and don't make him a buffoon. Now, Filoni, who headed the acclaimed Clone Wars animated series, has a theory as to why fans have remained fascinated with Fett, despite him having only six minutes of screen time in the original trilogy. And he says, I think the design of the costume, especially the helmet, is iconic, he says. The details from the dent in the crown of the helmet, the emblems, the scuff marks, the cloak, the braids, all spoke of a greater story and adventure than that character had experienced. Um, that the character had experienced. I think it was always fun to imagine what those uh, adventures were, and now we get to tell some of them. 
You know, and again, that's a really interesting aspect about the Book of Boba Fett, in my opinion, because, I, I, you know, I've kind of been looking at the Book of Boba Fett as secondary to The Mandalorian. But that's really only because The Mandalorian became so popular. I mean, in reality, the Boba Fett is a much more popular character. It has been for decades, ever since he was first, you know, seen prior to the release of The Empire Strikes Back after Star Wars became such a big hit. So the reality actually is, you know, the book of Boba Fett and Boba Fett having his own show is technically doing that thing with my fingers. At least it should be a bigger deal than The Mandalorian. However, The Mandalorian was such a huge success that I certainly wasn't looking at it that way. And it wasn't until recently that I began to sort of my wheels, you know, the, the, the gears in my head started to turn and go, you know, actually, this show is a really, really big deal. It, you know, uh, and again, it seems lesser so because there isn't much of a backstory on Boba Fett beyond what we recently got in the second season of The Mandalorian. The things written about Boba Fett before now, apart from the canonical films, were, you know, relegated to legends. And so his, you know, his background and what he was like was is fairly a mystery in the modern Disney Star Wars world. But Boba Fett in and of itself is an incredibly popular character. And like I said, it was only recently when I kind of came around and went, wow, the Book of Boba Fett is a massive deal. And and according to what I'm going to share with you here in a moment, they're definitely treating it that way because we're in for a lot of treats in this show, and it seems like they really did pull out all the stops. I imagine that the last episode of The Mandalorian Season 2 with the, spoiler alert, um, appearance of Luke Skywalker had an impact on the book of Boba Fett. Like we can go and do this and pull this and pull this off. And I think it's where a lot of franchises uh, franchises are going right now. Um, I won't spoil anything for those that haven't seen Spider-Man No Way Home, but I think Spider-Man No Way Home. And when you look at the Doctor Strange movie and the multiverse of madness, I think you're going to see a lot more intellectual properties, a lot more IPs that are going to be looking to bring in things from the past, even if they weren't necessarily that as popular as the things currently. They're going to bring those back in. We saw that happen with Ghostbusters Afterlife as well. If the Book of uh, of Boba Fett teaser released so far seemed a bit less than epic, it's due to a deliberate act of restraint. The producers have only revealed footage from the seven-episode season's opening minutes. We can't use the second half of the first episode because it gives so much away, Rodriguez says. But the basics are that Boba and his assassin partner, Fennec Shand, Ming-Na Wen, have taken over uh, Jabba's, uh, Jabba the Hutt's palace on Tatooine, a move that sends them on a journey into the previously unseen Star Wars underworld of crime families. Boba gives us a direct connection to the Star Wars saga since he was involved in that story, Filoni says. This creates a nice crossover point for both the classic characters and the new characters. Much of the Mandalorian was new or had not been seen on screen. Though Boba Fett, we can weave some of these characters through Boba Fett. We can weave some of those characters and tales um, together using a character that we don't know a lot about. Now, Now, Rodriguez adds that the character specifically invites a whole world from the underworld in with him. Uh, Things turn up you don't expect you see things we couldn't believe we got to do every episode has big surprises which gets me excited the producers hint uh hint the producer hints uh combined to suggest some familiar faces faces or helmets might be showing up especially if the series not only flashes back to how fed escaped the sarlacc pit as fans hope but just perhaps to other moments during fed's unseen time during the original trilogy era as well The Book of Boba Fett is unusual for a franchise action series in that it stars a 60-year-old Morrison and a 58-year-old Wen, who somehow looks like she still gets carted in bars. You never feel like they're an older cast. They're so youthful and energized, Rodriguez says. Tem and I work together. He really is Boba Fett. And for Wen, I would design whole sequences just to end on her and the look she would give Boba because he's just so badass. Tem knows this is his moment, and he knows this is her moment. And when you get actors like that, they go for it. It's palpable. Now, adds Filoni, Tem brings the intensity and sense of a weathered uh, experience and a well-trained bounty hunter needs while maintaining a sense of fun and adventure. He had more dialogue than Fed has ever had to deliver. It's also a very physical role, and Tem was there for it, training and enduring a lot of the action. 
Now, Wen's character was introduced in the first season of The Mandalorian and then was seemingly killed off. There was no seemingly, she said, with a laugh. It was very clear at the time. But Favreau and Filoni had a change of heart and decided to concoct a storyline whereby Boba revived Fren- Fennec uh, and, the, and the duo teamed up. And it was an interesting in the gallery, if you haven't watched the documentary on the Disney Plus series where they talked about this, where they showed the scene in that episode of The Gunslinger at the very, very end, that last shot of Fennec Shand allegedly lying on the, uh, on, the, on the desert floor dead. And you see the two legs walking up and the individual comes up and walks over to her. And Favreau even mentions how you can hear the spurs. And Filoni adds, yeah, right, spurs of Boba Fett. And that the fans, the hardcore fans, will get that that's Boba Fett. But a lot of the casual people won't. And even that was speculated as to whether or not it was going to be Boba Fett. And it obviously turned out to, to be true. When Wen made her deal to return, she thought she was simply signing on to more Mandalorian. Uh, they're so secretive that when dealing with the contracts, there isn't even a, uh, a title for the show. It's all under a pseudonym, she says. I naturally assumed it was I was doing The Mandalorian Season 3 when I showed up on the set, when ads, and that the spinoff feels more gritty than the other series. We've always dealt with the Empire and the Jedis, and this was about these gangster families. And has a rawness to it, she says. It's quite different from The Mandalorian, which is more like a Western. Part of the show's challenge will be distinguishing Fett from Disney Plus's other stoic, helmeted bounty hunter Mando, right? Mando was a character inspired by Boba Fett without technically being Boba Fett, right down to Mando freezing his captured fugitives in carbonite. One difference will come as a bit of relief. Unlike Mando, those creed mandates that conceal his identity Fett doesn't seem to have any particular qualms about removing his helmet, freeing the spinoff from the flagship series off restraint insistence on hiding Pedro Pascal's face. Rodriguez also points out that Fett's scant prior screen time leaves a lot of wiggle room for invention. The filmmakers seized on to King Conan and the Godfather for specific inspirations. Boba bites off more than he can chew, and we definitely do not make it easy for him, Rodriguez says. It's easy to sit on the throne. It's not easy to stay on it. So what's it like for a bounty hunter to have suddenly become the leader? uh, Where's the push and pull in that? What he's trying to become? What is he trying to become? We really go in depth into the character. Now, for Rodriguez, joining Star Wars has roots going back decades. His career has intersected with the franchise in many unexpected ways. While many genre filmmakers cite The Empire Strikes Back as an influential favorite, Rodriguez was perhaps even more impacted by the an hour-long making of special about Empire that aired on CBS. A 12-year-old Rodriguez taped the special on VCR and wore out, the ta- wore out that tape for years, he says. That's really what got me into filmmaking, just seeing the craftsmanship the movie took. There's no CG, it's all model stop motion. It made me want to go and do that stuff. Now, you fast forward to 2021 when Rodriguez was slow, was sound mixing Spy Kids at Skywalker Ranch. Since his debut with 1992's El Mariachi, which he famously shot for just $7,000, the filmmaker has typically worn many hats. IMDb credits him with crew positions ranging from soundtrack composer on 17 projects to editor on 30 projects and a camera operator on 11 projects. When Lucas heard of a young filmmaker was mixing his film's sound himself at the Marin County studio, he invited Rodriguez up to his office for a chat. George said, you should check out these digital cameras I'm using and showed me some of the green screen tricks. And that's what got me into shooting digital, Rodriguez said. He was a mentor at a stage where I went from doing films like From Dust Till Dawn and Desperado to doing the pioneering all green screen filmed Sin City. In addition to a love of technical innovation, Lucas and Rodriguez also have in common a sort of insider status. They strive to make popular films for wide audiences while maintaining their independence and control in hubs far from Hollywood. Rodriguez shoots most of his work in Austin, uh, though Boba Fett was in Los Angeles, helping fuel the region's production boom. As Rodriguez tells it, his Lucas-inspired segue into digital filmmaking eventually led to getting hired to direct writer-producer James Cameron's long gestating project, Alita Battle Angel, in 2019, a movie that I enjoy quite a bit and I do have on Blu-ray. A live-action anime adaptation that was widely praised for its CG work and became the biggest production ever shot in Texas. John saw Alita, and that got me into The Mandalorian, Rodriguez says. 
But the only reason I started doing high-tech filmmaking back then uh, in Austin, of all places, was because of George Lucas. So, as a certain Sith Lord once intoned, the circle is now complete. Asked if he discussed the Book of Boba Fett with Lucas during shooting, Rodriguez goes, uh, goes still, I can't tell you, he says. You don't need Jedi mind powers to figure that one out. The filming for the Book of Boba Fett began in late November 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, which played to Rodriguez's strength as an indie filmmaker accustomed to plowing forward and improvising amid uncertain conditions. I came out of the gate firing away. Let's shoot, 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 because we might not be here next week. We might get shut down, he says. But we never got shut down. So I was shooting sequences already edited to John and Dave after the first three weeks, and they were like, I can't believe how much you shot already. We kept shooting every day like it was going to be our last day. The pandemic also impacted the show's creative, as it incentivized the team to provide some escapist relief for fans. It was a bleak time that spurred us on even more to just make everything as entertaining as possible, Rodriguez says. While the budget for the project isn't known, it's likely somewhere in the ballpark of $100 million, uh, Disney spent for The Mandalorian's debut. Now, Rodriguez winded up directing nearly half of the episodes himself, three of the big ones, as he puts it, as well as voicing two characters, including the mayor, whose voiceover was is heard in the trailer. Ha, huh, that's funny. I have a mayor. I have a the mayor character in uh, book four, uh, five, excuse me, of the uh, of the Embark series, um, uh, the Rocket Queen. Before shooting sequences, when says the father of five would prev his ideas by filming with action figures in his backyard with his kids. Once again, drawing from his 12-year-old self and the show, and uh, then show the footage to the actors with sound effects. Rodriguez had to adhere to certain Star Wars standards, however, which sometimes meant coloring inside the lines. Inside the lines. There was nobody going, what are the rules? It was more like me saying, the color feels very safe. We want it to feel more dangerous. So can we change it to this color, he says. And they go, these are the colors we've used, so let's try one of these out. But I can't reveal what. So revealing a color would be a spoiler. And he goes on to say, it'll be evident when you see the show. Now looking forward, Rod uh, Rodriguez has recently finished filming an action thriller, Hypnotic, with Ben Affleck. He's developing a modern-day female-led Zorro reboot uh, directed by his sister, Rebecca Rodriguez. He's also signed on to an overall deal with HBO Max and has partnered with a cinema digum to relaunch the self-curated El Rey cable channel, which focused on indie genre titles as a streaming service. A much speculated Elita sequel is also still possible. Jim and I talked about it recently and we're still very interested. He says, I told him, let me deliver Boba and then let's figure out a pitch. As for the bounty hunters future, it's never been clearer whether Boba Fett is meant to be a limited or recurring series, and no surprise, the producers are not saying. Rodriguez thinks there's a good chance this is only the beginning of Fett's return, though the director is currently signed on to debut, uh, is, is currently signed for the debut season alone. If people really love it, I'm sure they'd want to make more, he says. And if they do, uh, fans might literally be the first uh, to know. So really interesting piece, and like I said, I you know I've I've, be I've I've become more and more excited for the book of Boba Fett, uh, and what it is that they could potentially do, especially thinking about what they accomplished with the Mandalorian in season two, knowing the fan reaction of bringing in Luke Skywalker at that last episode, and all of the potential intersections of original trilogy characters, um, especially if there are flashbacks, like he was saying that could appear in the book of Boba Fett, which would end up substantiating some of those rumors that we've talked about before on the show about the possibility of not only Grogu and Luke Skywalker appearing along with the Mandalorian in the book of Boba Fett, but maybe even a young Han Solo, depending on what iteration they decide to go and, uh, and do. So uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely excited now it's new star Wars. So of course I'm going to be excited, but at the same time, I'm actually really enthused for what the show can offer. Cause it sounds like they did pull out all the stops. And this goes back to that mentality shift that I experienced myself in thinking that the Mandalorian was a bigger, um, had a bigger fan. Right? It was a bigger deal than the book of Boba Fett. When the truth of the matter is no, the Book of Boba Fett and Boba Fett's been around a lot longer and has been way more popular than The Mandalorian has been for a long time. It's got high standards to live up to because of the quality of The Mandalorian. There is no doubt about that in my mind. But I think Disney and Lucasfilm know that they've got to deliver 
on every single one of these episodes. You know, especially as the article mentioned with streaming ser- ser- uh, services going through sluggish times, it seems as if they have to make sure that every single one of these shows is a home run. And it sounds as if, as Rodriguez said, they're going to be pulling out all the stops in the book of Boba Fett. So, as always, what do you think, talkshownerd at gmail.com? Um, I will be continuing the shows throughout the rest of the year. we got another one uh, coming up uh, next week. Try to get that one done probably um, uh, the day before Christmas, maybe Christmas Eve, or maybe get it recorded on the 23rd is when I start uh, start vacation. But there will definitely be another show leading into the Book of Boba Fett, and, of course, a show uh, immediately after the Book of Boba Fett so I can share my uh, my reactions. But as always, I would love to hear from you. Talk show nerd at gmail.com, and you can also leave a comment uh, up on uh, – on YouTube. I need someone to show me my place in all this. I just got a couple of uh, emails this week from some friends of the show. Miranda Alicia writes in and says, Wow, can you all believe that it's been two years since the sequel trilogy was over? This month of December ought to be National Star Wars Month. Who needs May the 4th or Disney Plus Day when you uh, got when you got that? The fandom sure knows how to make it timeless and unforgettable. Yeah, it's been funny. I've been going through my um, my Facebook. Uh, uh, you know, every day they have the little you know, your little own history timeline. You can go back and look at what things you posted throughout the years um, on this particular day. And so many of the days have been filled with posts from me excited about the opening of the Force Awakens and excited about the opening of. Of the Last Jedi and and uh, and soon coming up, you know, the rise of Skywalker is uh, as well. And as a matter of fact, it was pretty cool. Somebody, um, I did radio in Tucson, and that's where I saw um, the Force Awakens for the first time at this uh, at a at a movie theater at a place called the Foothills Mall in Tucson, Arizona. And um, there was a listener to the show that I did there, and they were in the audience. And maybe I saw the photo back when he posted it. I don't remember, but he posted this photo of me. He was several rows in front as we waited that 45 minutes after we got into the theater for the lights to go down and for the uh, the fanfare to, uh, to to start. But he snapped a picture of me, um, you know, a few rows back, talking to probably my son or a, or a, just another listener in, there in the uh, in the audience. Um, and I was like, "Oh man, that's cool!" And I grabbed the photo and I saved it just because it was a nice little uh, nice little nostalgic uh, memory. I'll never forget that day, man. That was the slowest day in my entire lifetime. Uh, they talk about time being relative. Sitting there for that forty five minutes felt like a week. It was just it was just crazy. And I remember walking out of the theater just kind of stunned at what I'd seen. You know, just because you see new Star Wars after all these years when you didn't think you were going to see any more. Um, but yeah, but again, of course, and I really love that film as well. All right, Shlomo writes in, friend of the show. I haven't emailed in a while, so I thought I would engage in some Star Wars nerd hypotheticals. I had to say that word right. Hypotheticals. You were uh, speaking of the rule of two last week. Everyone always speaks of the rule of two. Frankly, I don't believe it exists, right, Shlomo? The only time that we ever hear about the rule of two in canon is is, uh, from Yoda, a Jedi. Well, I'm going to put up here a front, Shlomo. This has been covered in books that are canon. So the rule of two is essentially canon. But I still want to read the rest of your comments. All evidence from the Sith side is that that doesn't exist, he says. Does Dooku become a Master Sith in a few years between the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones? Is Sidious training Dooku and Maul at the same time? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, The Inquisitors are trained. Sidious uh, Sidious is trying to turn Luke with Vader's full knowledge, and there's an entire planet full of Sith devotees. Well, the Inquisitors aren't technically Sith, so I got you there. Um... You know, and as as far as Luke and, and Vader go, I think there's always going to be a trade off, right? If Vader is old, more machine now than man, and Palpatine sees the opportunity for a younger Jedi, he'll probably he probably would have dispatched Vader in favor of Luke Skywalker, adhering to the rule of two. Uh, Sidious himself expected to be re- de- defeated by Anakin, who is stronger. I think the rule of two is just an observation and not anything the Sith a- hold as sacred. If it existed, then Sith knowledge would always diminish, as no Sith master would pass on his knowledge for fear of being usurped. Well, again, I do believe it exists, but that is a very good point. Rather, I believe the Sith have many apprentices, and the masters set uh, them against one another to seeking the strongest. And I think that's true, too, but I think seeking the strongest in order to adhere to the rule of two to just bring on one apprentice to the master. To which his uh, essence and the essence of all other Sith Masters would be passed, as we see in The Rise of Skywalker. I'm going on record that after our little green friend that uh, that our little green friend was just wrong. 
this is the part where you talk uh, where you talk to everyone listening to the podcast and tell them that I'm right. <laughs> Not quite slow mo. I appreciate your speculation. I think it. I think a lot of your commentary does fit into the fact that the rule of two does exist in canon beyond the films, and it has been talked about quite a bit in books. Um, but I think that's what always makes it controversial is the fact that you know how would you pass on that history, and you know training multiple apprentices, right? The attention would be that you're going to get rid of one of them if the one of them ends up being stronger than the uh, if one of them ends up being stronger than the other. And that wraps up the show for this week. Again, thank you so much for checking out my Nerd World of Star Wars podcast. If you want to support the show, I hope you'll go out and purchase a copy of my science fiction space opera series, Embark. Available in an ebook, paperback, hardback, and audiobook. Currently still working on book seven. I should have had it done by now, but I've had a lot of things going on in life and it's delayed me from really sitting down and writing um, as much as I wanted to. But I do plan on doing my best to try to complete the book. Uh, during my Christmas vacation coming up. However, you can go out and pick up the opening trilogy in ebook as a box set for just three ninety nine, which is a discount because right now you can purchase the first three books in the series for ninety nine cents, two ninety nine, and two ninety nine. So that would be Embark Book One, Book Two, Treasure in Darkness, and Book Three, The Vanishing War, War, which tells a cohesive story. But either way, I hope you'll go out and at least check out Book One. In Book One. Katha dreamed of traveling beyond the known galaxy. Now humanity's survivor, survival will depend on it. After her beloved aerospace engineer father mysteriously passed away, headstrong pilot Katha Morrow discovers he left something behind for only her to find. Her excitement quickly turns to fear when she learns that an industrial accident inside a D-Corp civilian and military spacecraft factory has sparked an apocalyptic chain of events. While the ruthless Sin Argum of D-Corp attempts to exploit the global evacuation and gain control... Katha realizes the significance of what she's found and can't escape her destiny. As Earth's evacuees stand on the brink of annihilation, with the help of a ragtag squadron of pilots, Katha must be, uh, might be humanity's greatest hope and o- greatest and only hope against the tyranny of D Corp's evil leader. Head, uh, head on over to Amazon.com and uh, look for Embark and John J O N Justice, or you can just go to MyNerdWorld.net. Merry Christmas to you early. We'll be back again next week with an episode right around Christmas time. But I hope you're having a fantastic holiday season. And we are, wherever you are, you are happy and you are healthy and you are safe. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye. The Force will be with you always. My nerd world. <laughs>